Coming up on Mayo Clinic Q&A, we're talking boosters. Who's eligible and will a booster really provide more protection against COVID-19? All of the boosters would dramatically boost your antibody response. And people are kind of focused on that because that's what we report. We report that because that's what we can measure. But it's only one part of the story. I would make the decision about a booster based on how did you respond to whatever you got originally, and are there any unique risk factors that you have? The Food and Drug Administration has updated its authorizations to allow medical providers to boost eligible people with a vaccine other than the one that they initially received. This is also known as mix and match. But given the choice, is one better than another? There's no magic in it at all. There's not one that you can say, wow, that's the one to get. All of them do spectacularly well in protecting against severe disease, hospitalization, death, even moderate disease. Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. We're recording this podcast on Tuesday, October the 26th, 2021. I'm here welcoming back Dr. Greg Poland, who's here to give us our latest updates on COVID and vaccines. Welcome back, Greg. Thank you, Helena. I'm thrown a little bit because we're doing this on Tuesday, and typically you and I record together on Mondays. Yes, a little different, but you know, here we sit in chilly Rochester. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It is turning to fall, that is for sure. No question. <laughs> well, Greg, give us the latest on infection rates and vaccination rates in the U.S. and around the world, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there's good news and bad news, kind of mixed news, if you will, uh, in, in that regard. Cases are falling. No, no question about that. Whereas That's we were, news. yeah, whereas we were bumping up against 200,000 cases a day. Uh, on average, over the last week, we've been at about 73,000 cases a day. So it, it's not like nothing but dramatically decreased. We're down to about 1,700 uh, Americans dying each day uh, oh. from, from COVID, still way, way too much. About 58% of the US population is fully vaccinated, but we have about 90% of US counties that still have high or substantial transmission. So we, we have a ways to go. But, and I really want to stress this, Helena, we, we have an opportunity. Cases have fallen down. We've seen this happen three times before, four times, really. And then what happens is we begin to pretend the pandemic is over. We begin to loosen all of the restrictions, and it sh we have another surge. There is a lot of concern about this possibility of a surge with Thanksgiving, winter, Christmas, and what to call it, COVID fatigue. Mm -hmm. um, so if, we, if we're bigger than those things, and we say, no, you, you got to wear a mask indoors, you got to be vaccinated, if it's appropriate for you to get a booster, those are things that may get us through the winter, in addition to a topic I'm sure we're going to talk about, which is kids and immunization. If we get them uh, immunized. I think we have an opportunity that we've had few of during this pandemic. The question is, will we embrace that opportunity or will we once again pretend the pandemic is over? Two of the things that you said really struck me, Greg. One was 58% of Americans. That doesn't sound that high to me. I know. It sounds lower than I would have liked for you to Yes, have said. of course. <laughs> and the other thing is that you said people act like the pandemic is over. Well, if you have flown on an airplane recently, it is crowded in the airports. Yeah. And yeah. you would think um, that the pandemic was over by well, how many people are traveling and how tightly packed those airplanes are. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and, and kind of the more discouraging thing, at least on an airplane, you're mandated to wear a mask. Right. But trying to get people to wear masks in other indoor venues. And again, with the holidays coming, which for the most part are going to be indoors, this is a potential looming, yet again, another surge. 
So Greg, last week, one of the big pieces of news was about this mix and match boosters yeah. being recommended by the CDC. What does that mean and what are the implications? Yeah, so just to be a little careful about this, what mix and match means is that regardless of what you got for your primary series, you could get any of the other three vaccines available for use in the US as your booster, if you're eligible for a booster. Now, these results are coming from an NIH study, a relatively small study showing both safety and uh, a boost in antibody levels. As we've talked about in this show, that's only one part of the story. It did not measure, and we don't know about T cells, just antibody levels. So the point is they're following what happened in Israel, that with time, they saw an increasing number of breakthrough cases embarked on a booster program, dramatically suppressed and decreased those breakthrough cases. The key there is what kind of cases are we talking about? Are they severe death, hospitalization, or asymptomatic and mild cases? And there's not as much science as I would like to see around this whole idea of boosters and, and third doses in the case of mRNA vaccines. But nonetheless, that recommendation was made. And so who is eligible for a booster <clears throat> at this time, Greg? So um, anybody who is 65 and older, mm -hmm. anybody 18 and older living in a long-term care setting or with underlying medical problems that put them at risk for severe disease, or like you and I that live or work in a setting where we are um, exposed more often and run higher risks of disease. So medical professionals, uh, if you lived in a group home setting, uh, a prison, you know, anything like that where you're congregated in large numbers. One other thing, Helena, about the boosters that uh, Bear is saying is that these are for people 18 and older who meet the criteria for a booster. The J&J &J booster can be given any time two months or longer after the first dose. For the two mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, those are generally given six or more months after the primary series. The other thing is that for all of these, the dose for the booster is the same with the exception of Moderna, which will be half the dose that you received as your primary doses. Greg, so we have our savvy listeners asking you questions about the boosters now, and they want to know how do people know which booster to get? For instance, a listener asked, will one of the boosters give me a higher, higher antibody levels than the others? Why are Pfizer and J&J &J the same dose, but Moderna's booster is half dose? Yeah, all good questions. So all of the boosters would dramatically boost your antibody response. And people are kind of focused on that because that's what we report. We report that because that's what we can measure. But it's only one part of the story. And you know, the nature of Americans is that more is always better. We, we don't know that. Presumably that's true, but we don't know that there's an advantage to having your antibody increase 35 fold versus 70 fold. Uh, who says that, that that's better, particularly in view of B and T cell activity? So I, I wouldn't get too hung up on that. Rather, I would make the decision about a booster based on how did you respond to whatever you got originally? And are there any unique risk factors that you have? For example, because of the very, very rare chance of this TTS, this blood clotting disorder in younger women, I would prefer not to use a J&J &J booster. Um, if, you, if you had some other side effect or reaction to one of the other vaccines, you might say, well, I'm gonna use a different vaccine. So I honestly, there's no magic in it at all. There's not one that you can say, wow, that's the one to get. All of them do spectacularly well in protecting against severe disease, hospitalization, death, even moderate disease. So you're then talking about, well, does one better prevent asymptomatic or mild disease than the other? We don't have that much science to know that. 
<clears throat> so there's, there's nothing we can say really about that that would be solid scientifically. You alluded earlier to the fact that we were going to talk about kids and vaccines. So could you give us an update, Greg, on where are we? A decision is forthcoming soon, I think, about yeah, kids and Yeah, yeah. Well, in fact, uh, Helena, today is an exciting day because the FDA Advisory Committee is going to meet and talk about this very issue. My prediction, they have not yet met. I don't think they start till nine o'clock or so. My prediction is that they will approve it. Uh, for Pfizer. And the reason for that is that they have presented data showing uh, spectacularly good immune responses, not surprisingly, in these young kids to a dose that's a third the adult dose. So instead of 30 micrograms, they'll get 10 micrograms. And uh, saw no- so They still get two shots. Yes, right? yeah, yeah, yes. But saw no particular safety concerns at all. So my, rec my, my understanding and, and uh, my own guess is that they will likely approve that today. It will then go to CDC for approval. And I would not be surprised to see uh, uh, kids starting to get immunized in the latter part of the first week of November. So this is exciting news. These oh, kids soon. are at risk. Um, as you know, they can spread disease and they represent a large block of the US population that of course is unvaccinated. And it's an opportunity. No, I was just thinking it sounds like a pun. I didn't mean it that way for a shot at a, at a more normal kid's life, you know? So uh, I'm excited about that. And what ages will this be, Greg? This will be five to 11 year olds. Five to 11 yeah. years old. Okay. Now studies are being done in, in that will go down to age six months with lower and lower doses, because again, you know, those are healthy kids. Their immune systems are, are Ferraris compared to our Chevrolet or, you know, our slower uh, immune okay. systems. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Greg, another listener wonders about booster shots for those younger than 65 who don't fall into the current risk categories. They thought it would be nice with the holidays coming and people uh, being closer together that, um, more individuals could get boosters who are six months out from their original series and be protected. When will all of us be eligible for boosters? So it, it's a good question. It's unclear. There's no meeting at this point scheduled for that at any of the advisory committees. I don't disagree with that sentiment. Um, uh, several countries, Israel being the first one, I think they're down to 18 maybe or 30, I can't remember, for routine boosters. So uh, why do it? Well, on the one hand, they're not at, really at risk for severe disease, death, or, or hospitalization. That would be very rare if they otherwise had a primary series. But you are still having breakthrough cases. And when you have a breakthrough case, you increase the opportunity of spreading that, transmitting that disease to those who are unvaccinated or have weaker immune systems. So I, I actually think it's a good idea. I think that's what we will come to learn is that immunization, full immunization against coronavirus, COVID-19, is two priming doses and a booster dose. Right. Well, thank you, Greg. Any last yeah. words for us today? You know, I, I think uh, a couple of things. One of the phenomena that's being seen nationwide, it's true here in Minnesota too, is that we are beginning to recognize quite a discrepancy between those who live in the more rural areas and those who live in the more urban areas. In fact, the risk of death due to COVID in the rural areas is twice that, even within the same state, twice that of the urban areas. And that has to do with, uh, I think one, a generally older population living in the rural area and not necessarily understanding or rejecting the need for these vaccines and for boosters. So uh, I know we have many uh, listeners from actually all over the world, getting vaccinated is your singularly best strategy augmented by wearing a mask. I know not everybody shares that belief, but this is not about beliefs. This is what does the science show? What did the data show? And in fact, let me make one other observation. 
when you look at the highest immunization rates and the lowest infection rates, it's among the most highly educated, the more wealthy, the people who live uh, in more urban areas rather than rural areas. So if you don't fit one of those three categories, you have to stop and think, what do they know that I don't know? Why are they all getting vaccine and not getting sick? But we are. And maybe that's one avenue into opening that door to rethink your position if you're not wearing masks and haven't gotten a vaccine or a booster. This is really important. We're going on two years now of this pandemic, and yet we have all the tools we need to end this pandemic. And we just have not been able to bring ourselves as a nation to do it. Very good points, Greg. I had seen an article in one of the major news networks yesterday about um, that there are physicians who are unaware of treatment options for early mm. COVID. So before mm. hospitalization, and I'm, I'm thinking specifically of monoclonal antibody yes. therapy. Yeah. And I thought, well, how tragic that would be if people were not uh, able to receive um, appropriate care as well. You're exactly right, Helena. I mean, compared to uh, a year and a half uh, ago, it is, it is miraculous the therapies that we have developed in this amount of time. Monoclonal antibodies being primary among them, a along with antivirals. In fact, the, the Merck oral antiviral is being reviewed now in Europe, and I think soon uh, in, in the US too. But definitely avail yourself of those therapies where appropriate under the guidance of your healthcare provider. And don't hesitate to ask about them. Now, I know that there are some areas that have very, very high rates of disease still, where it's, it's sometimes hard to find them and they run out of them. Um, again, no need for that. Get a vaccine <laughs> um, and, and not wait for you know, an expensive, more difficult therapy after infection and complications have happened. Sage advice. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> Pleasure. Our thanks to Dr. Greg Poland, vaccine, infectious disease, and virology expert from the Mayo Clinic for being with us here again today to give us our COVID-19 updates. I hope that you learned something. I know that I did. And we wish each of you a wonderful day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org, then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.